Do you feel deeply connected with your ancestors? With members of your literal family who have gone before or maybe with people who inspire you and how they lived or worked to make things better so that your life could be possible? Frankly, I always, I haven't always. Sometimes when I'm in worship services and in community organizing and we're asked to remember our ancestors and to invoke them into the room to speak their names aloud, invite them into the space, I, I'm not sure what to do. Um, I, I feel a little bit sad about that. Um, but sometimes I'm just sitting there kind of puzzled. Like, am I supposed to be thinking about my grandma? But what does she have to do with this meeting I'm at? Or like, should I just start naming activists I've heard of? And then I feel weird. And I feel jealous of people who, um, speak of feeling of their ancestors, holding them up in times of struggle. The, those of us who, sit, who say that you know you, quote, are bringing with you in every breath and every step, everyone who has come before you, all the yous that you have ever been, the mothers of your father, the fathers of your father, the unbroken line of ancestors. I have historically felt a little bit left out of that. And of course, it's true that um, not every religious or spiritual practice has to resonate with me, I'm not the arbiter of all of those things. And it doesn't have to resonate with you. It doesn't have to resonate with anyone. And yet, I, I yearn to have some connection like that. And I hear from organizers and from especially white anti-racists um, about the importance of understanding where we came from. And this is the part of my story that's particular to me, but I share it because maybe um, it'll help you reflect on where your journey is with ancestors. Um, Yardana Peacock is a Kentucky-based writer and activist, and they wrote this. White supremacy's biggest win is to disconnect people from knowing where we came from. For white folks, there is simultaneously a message that we belong everywhere, and yet a disconnection from learning or valuing the roots of where we actually come from. While this is not across the board, there is overwhelmingly less emphasis on white people to know our ancestors because privilege and power can disconnect us from our lineages. For white people committed to dismantling internal and external oppression and supremacy systems, the salve for our pain and oppression is to build a culture of belonging where love is central." End quote. So I hear that those of us who are white can help show up more fully in dismantling white supremacy and working for justice if we work through some real understanding of where we come from. And that can include our literal family um, can also include finding and nurturing um, connections in our imagination and our envisioning with white people in and outside our family who worked um, for justice. And so I am on this journey to connect with my ancestors a little bit more, um, both in my family and in the wider family of all souls, the family of humanity, the family of the, of the people who have enabled me to live the life that I can. And one challenge, of course, that many of us face is that not all of our ancestors were that great. Um, that shows up in a lot of different ways, I'm sure. I know um, so many of our families include some really hard stuff. Um, and I'm not gonna get into all of that. Um, I just wanna name that I know that trauma and brokenness exist in our families and there are very real reasons why we may not be in touch with people in our family or, or why there's pain there. So I'm not saying we have to, to sort of go into that in a way that's overwhelming. Um, and at least for me, I think honesty and, and facing who those people are and were is important and, and good, especially when some of the things that are not that great are systemic. 
Um, so in my case, that has to do with whiteness. Um, and a particular hard thing for white people reckoning um, with racism is envisioning and imagining and reckoning with the choices that our ancestors made in the context of white supremacy. Um, I, I think I've talked to you and I talked about Reverend Preston Bond. He was this um, ancestor of mine who was a Methodist preacher who lived in Kentucky and in the 1840s and um, longer. Um, he was on the side of the Union uh, and he was a person who had slaves. And um, it is through the Reverend Bond that I am connected with someone really cool. Um, and that is the late Julian Bond, who is the, was the black civil rights leader who among other things, he helped found the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the Southern Poverty Law Center. He was the chair of the NAACP from 1998 to 2010. Um, and this, you can probably fill the story in in your head about how we're related um, because it's not unfamiliar uh, in this country. And um, I'm descended from the Reverend Bond and his wife. And Julian Bond is descended from the Reverend Bond and the enslaved woman who was his housekeeper. And um, that's a hard um, ancestor to face, honestly. I think my, um, the move in my family has sometimes been to, to minimize that um, and to talk about um, to talk about Jane Bond, the uh, woman who was enslaved in, in ways that aren't, um, I don't think fair or helpful or honest about the, the oppression she lived under. Um, so it's hard for me to think about him as an ancestor. And uh, it's Im important that he was a minister. Um, so he's an ancestor in blood and in vocation. He's the only, I think the only other minister I know of in my direct lineage. And he wasn't great in that way. And so I tell this story, I think it's useful to lift up and to, to unearth stories like this, um, both specifically and emblematically. So in a country that is so messed up about um, so many things, um, I have to wonder how much, um, how much were my ancestors fighting against the status quo and how much were they upholding those values? How much were they working for justice and how much were they not always? How much Jim Crow is there in my background? How much xenophobia? Part of the work of connecting with ancestors is sitting carefully with the pain of, the, of that and the sadness and the maybe guilt and shame. And doing this discernment about what parts of, um, what parts of our ancestors do we want to carry forward and which parts do we want to leave behind or at least be honest about and then not continue. One of the hymns in our Unitarian Universalist hymnal talks about comrades gone before urging what they dreamed be ours to do. And I just feel like that has to be taken with a grain of salt. Like, did my ancestors dream things that I want to do? Maybe, maybe not. Um, and so maybe sometimes it takes a little work to dig up the pieces that we do want to carry forward. Um, maybe this journey is not about taking people as um, heroes or villains um, or victims, um, sifting through their lives for bits of shared values or for tenacity, for things that they've learned, ways they've survived through trauma, through struggle. So many, of course, so many of my ancestors served in war in many ways. Um, and one of the only things we hear about was my great, great grandfather. Um, he never talked at all about the Civil War, uh, except for that when World War I was, was breaking out, he read the headline to himself, put down the newspaper and said, will they never learn? That's the only thing he said. 
and I just I have to imagine what the trauma of of war was like for him and, and what he would have wanted me uh, as his descendant to know about that and to do and how to live maybe I think about that maybe in hard times I remember another civil war veteran on my dad's side Evan Jones who is a bit Welsh as you can perhaps hear from that name who according to family legend it's something like um, he was mustered out of the Union Army at the end of the war in North Carolina and then just freaking walked home to Ohio just just walked home So I wonder, what do I think of my ancestors? And another challenge is, I wonder, what would my ancestors think of me, of a queer woman, Unitarian Universalist preacher? What if they wouldn't like me, or what if they wouldn't approve of me, or what would they, what would they even think of my life? I asked my mom about this. Um, Hi, mom. <laughs> Uh, and she said, I took comfort in what she said. She said, you know, on my side, I think those strict German Lutherans probably could not imagine life as it is now or what it's like to be you. But I think we all want our descendants to be happy. And what that means depends on the time you live in and the circumstances. So perhaps those strict German Lutherans on my mom's side would not approve of the way um, everything about my life. But Maybe they would approve of the way I show love for people by baking them cake um, or nod in approval at my lighting of an advent wreath, keeping some tradition alive. Maybe my grandfather Norman, whom I never knew, um, who's a longtime elder in his Presbyterian church and taught Sunday school. Um, I don't know that he would have approved of gay women pastors, but Maybe I would be a good person to invoke in those times when I'm sitting in a long committee meeting that he was in a lot of those. And then of course, there are also ancestors outside our family, ancestors of spirit and institution and values. I know some of you have done some work around that, and, um, identifying people who inspire you and have paved the way. And I've been thinking about the people who made it possible for me to be who I am and cleared the way for me to live a life of um, working for justice, um, trying to be more compassionate, trying to orient myself towards love. And I, I think especially of how brave um, people who were lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, how brave those people had to be for so long in just something as simple as sharing a kiss in public let alone marching for rights or um, just you know living living as a as a member of society there's i came across someone um, her name is phoebe ann coffin hannaford i don't know if you've heard of her but she was the first woman ordained as a universalist minister in new england and the first woman to serve as a chaplain to the connecticut state legislature and it turns out she was a woman who separated from her husband and lived with a woman named Ellen Miles, a woman people called the minister's wife. This is her. Um, I love thinking about her. You know, maybe she was a gay woman preacher before that was a thing people even talked about or named. All this is to say, I hope there are ancestors who you love thinking about who you can think of with gratitude in whole or in part, um, seeing yourself in their resilience and their persistence, their survival, their joy. Um, I hope you can um, connect honestly with where you're, you've come from, um, that you have the courage to sit with some of the pain and discomfort if there is some of that, and that you can envision um, ancestors as proud of you and where you are and how far you've come and how much you've lived and loved in that line of um, hearing the thunder and hearing their applause. May their memory be a blessing. <laughs>